the real world. Like you're solving something that is ultra complex. What do people normally do in life now when they come in contact with something that's ultra complex? They run from it. On this week's episode of the Infusion Breakdown Show, the Breakdown crew sat down among ourselves to discuss in what ways is the American education system falling behind, what it does well, as well as how can we improve it. Let's see what we come up with. Before we get started on today's episode, I'd like to introduce to you our Black-Owned Business of the Week, where we showcase quality Black-owned businesses for you to support every week. This week's business is Know Your Direction Marketing by Sydney Carey. Know Your Direction Marketing specializes in natural health and nutrition, skin care, cosmetics, and home care products. If you're interested in seeing what they have to offer, give their Facebook page a follow. So the question we have for today, why is the education system in America falling behind other countries? Comment below, let us know your opinion. We also have timestamps in the description below as always. Be sure to check them out. Oh, but yeah, just a little backstory. This topic came about in another episode when I was talking about uh, people being lazy and combined with our freedoms. That's a part of the reason the United States is behind in education. And I essentially said that the reason Korea or China has better academic numbers is because they have no other choice. Because if they don't, they will be met with some type of consequences that they don't want. Whereas we as Americans have more of a freedom to not do well in school if we don't like it or whatever. Because for most of us, our consequences like isn't, isn't that bad. I know if I did bad in school, I didn't, uh, I didn't get beatings, but I did get a lecture. But the consequences of me hearing uh, that lecture didn't cause me to do better in school. And some kids are motivated by the fear of consequences um, that come with their parents, or they simply just want to get good grades for their parents. But uh, for me, when I got all A's, I did it for myself. And, um, but the point is we were able to choose our motivation because of that freedom we have. Whereas in like Asian cultures, bad grades, bad grades probably result in like corporal punishment or dishonor in some way. Uh, so that's really what I meant in, that, uh, in regards to that really. I was trying to go back and watch the episode in which you referenced the specific statistic about the uh, reading average of the United States being eighth grade level, mm-hmm. but I couldn't find which episode it was. But yeah, I looked. Wait, you, up, said, you said uh, you said you were trying to do what? Trying to watch the episode where you referenced it initially. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I, do you remember what episode it was? I I have no idea, okay, <laughs> but I know yeah, it was within like the past month or so. Yeah, I feel of like. course. Yeah, I, I'm, uh, yeah, I don't want to reference of a bad episode like a wrong episode or anything but yeah it was definitely a recent uh, i want to say it's a 2020 episode but yeah i don't know but okay. been. so what you you said these numbers and these scores and so aside from the reading average i, I feel like um, i didn't say scores though I feel, I feel like i just referenced it but i don't think i necessarily said scores okay so like how, how do you want how do you want to frame this what, what you just were explaining just now about the american system, uh, education system being behind well, you can go with the scores, but I thought you was referencing off of what I said for specifically. No, 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 no. Oh, okay, gotcha. Okay, I was Sorry. asking what you were just saying. Okay, no, you got. But you. I'm curious about. So we've seen that the national reading average is at eighth grade reading level, seventh or eighth grade, depending on where you look. Mm-hmm. And then I looked at another uh, metric. It was by the Organization of Economic and Cooperation and Development, the OECD, and they do a test. It's the Program for International Student Assessment, the PISA test. And so there's 37 different countries that participate in this test. And the United States, we actually do better than I thought we did, except for in one key category. So we had a score. Our mean uh, score in that test was 7 out of 37. So so we placed 7th out of 37 other countries. And then in science, we were number 10. And then in math, we were 28th, which that's pretty atrocious. And just a bit of background, the PISA test is a test that's administrated to to 15-year-olds in these countries that participate just to measure up and see how the different education systems are performing and uh, see if there's anything that's particularly problematic. And I guess the the biggest thing that was most alarming to me was the math scores, 28th out of 37 countries. So we are in like the the lower half of the barrel. And so I thought that was particularly interesting. I think that the statistic I found, and this is all data from 2018, I'll post the, the webpage to where I got this all from, but it, the data about the mean reading level being 7 out of 37, that's a direct contradiction to what I thought about the 8th grade reading average, but then I, that took into consideration. This is also compiling data of adults and people who are living in the, in the country, so not just people who are currently in school. Like, yes, the students may be able to pass these reading tests and have good grades, but it's a well-known fact that reading is a pass by the minority, too, so if you don't use those skills continuously and you're honing them, then of course they're going to atrophy. So that, that's another way where I had identified that uh, 
we weren't doing so great, particularly in math. Right, it's mainly in math, though. Yeah. Okay. My question to you is, what's the pu- what's the purpose of a public education? What do you mean exactly? Like, what would you expect? What is a reasonable expectation that you have for the public school ex- education system? Me, myself? Yeah. A reasonable ex- expectation for the public school education system? Correct. Teach them everything. Well, I don't even have that. I guess looking at, on the outside looking in, I guess you could say uh, teaching them every all the skills that they actually need to in the real world. That expectation, but I feel like, okay, yeah, yeah, that, that's my answer. Expecting that they, at the very least, teach them the actual skills that they need in the real world. Why do you ask? I think that's important to define success or failure as a criteria. The definition I came up with was, or what I think the purpose should be, is to create functional adults that have knowledge of skills that can be successful in most day-to-day scenarios. Because you think you have students from all walks of life and then people with all kinds of career aspirations and futures. So to skew it one way too far, you would be doing a disservice to the other group. So of course, like you, you can only reasonably expect an education to be average, to, to encompass what most people are going to encounter with the exception of like AP classes, dual enrollment and stuff like that to where, I mean, there, there are plenty, especially in the higher levels as you advance through the upper part of middle school and then the high school. And I say, in most cases, you are going to get that, that average education. So I think that should be a reasonable expectation that most people should be able to take those skills that they learn through school and be able to apply them in day-to-day life. And you're saying you feel like the education system does that? I'm saying that's what the goal should be. But you don't, but I'm saying, do you I feel think, like they do I that? think there's components that are missing. I, I don't want to, like, I know we're gonna be critiquing the education system here, but I'm not gonna act like I can design a better system. And I'm not going to tear down things that, that I feel that they do that they do great. Like the argument about things that aren't needed, for example, like math. And I can use myself as a perfect example for that. I hated math um, all throughout school. I think that was the only class I may have ever gotten to see in. Everything else I was just A's and B's, especially science. I was straight A student just about. And um, the whole time throughout school, right up until May when I graduated high school, I thought I was going to be a graphic design major. And so in that case, yeah, I may have never used math again. But then in May, I changed my mind to computer science. And as part of that, the curriculum requires you to take up to like Calc 3 in college. So I ended up taking more and more math. So that became more of a, it became a bigger part of my education than I perceived. So for me to say that, okay, I'm never going to use this. That's, that's really arrogant of me to say that because at a certain age, when you're that young, you really don't know what you want to do with the rest of your life. But there were some things that I identified that I would like to have seen implemented in the school systems on a larger scale, such as like home economics. Like my school, we didn't have that. We did have stuff like shop class, keyboarding, accounting, finance, stuff like that. But I really think home economics would have been a huge benefit, like domestic skills for for guys and girls. These are just things that I think every functional adult should be equipped with. And then, like I said, accounting and finance, we did have that, but I don't know about other school systems. I know the other ones did lack that. And then programming of some sort, we know how big like the tech industry is, and that's where, where jobs are constantly being created. But one thing that I really would like to see implemented in the school systems, and I don't think that anyone does this particularly well, we didn't really have this, or we, we didn't, actually, even though I went through one of the best school systems in the area. So I would like to see scholastic exploration implemented, and my problem with this is we end up with students going to college and, and university, and they're spending tons and tons of money and they're being undeclared. So the university has no, they have no incentive to avoid that because if, as long as you're there and you're spending money, they're happy, which, okay, it's a business. They're getting money, you're getting an education. I understand that. But I feel like we should provide an arena with uh, for free of penalty, at least as much as possible for the students to explore their interest and other career paths prior to them stepping into a phase where they have to commit fully to shelling out money for things like that. So it could look like maybe just like one period a day, exploring a major, exploring a career option and getting more familiar with that. And then if you don't like it, you can change, but it's just for information purposes. And so with that, they're more informed when it comes time to make those decisions where they can commit and they have real consequence. And I think as a direct result, 
that the phenomenon of undeclared majors would drop down significantly. Like when I was working with housing at ODU, so we did a lot of retention programs and stuff. We looked at the data for these things and a lot of the kids who drop, they're undeclared. So I think that in itself is a problem. The fact that like not everyone is going to go to college, but the ones who are going to college, I think that that is something that could additionally be used to to prepare them for that. And then even the ones who don't, they could still look into like trades and other th- and occupations because regardless of whether or not you go to school afterwards, you're gonna have to have a, a future of some sort. You're gonna have to do something occupation wise. So I would like to see that. I think that's probably something the, the biggest thing is like the preparation for the real world and give you something to where like the consequences aren't, aren't present. Okay, Doug. Um, let's see, where can I begin? Um, I won't necessarily partake 100% in, I guess, like the full barrage of the question or give pride of barrage answers for the question, just because I'm not too well versed with, you know, ramifications and really what, you know, an Asian school system provides their students versus a European school system versus the American school system. Um, I guess to answer the very first question, or you want to call it, consider this the second question, what do, uh, what's the purpose of public uh, education? I think for me, the main purpose of public ed- education should be to develop and mold, you know, multidimensional thinkers. And the reason why I say multidimensional thinkers is because as you guys were kind of talking and, you know, Brian mentioned that as he switched his major, he had to go up to count three. When I you know, think back to my out going from algebra, algebra two, trig, and then geometry. Like each step up required a different method and a different realm of thinking to be successful at that, um, you know, at that given subject. And I think you can apply the same thing to language arts, whether it be you know poetry, um, you know, learning to write a five-page paper that contains words of your own. Um, whether it be history, whether you want to understand all the confluences and nuances between, you know, your branches of government and all of that. I think it teaches multidimensional thinkers, but I will preface that or, you know, follow up with saying that the lack of transparency and exposure, um, you know, between what's taught in schools and what you experience in the real world kind of creates a, a trust issue itself. Like, I think we're actually kind of given tools to be successful but because we're expecting, you know, to apply everything we learn verbatim into the real world, it kind of creates this blurred lines, you know, kind of trust issue thing. Like we, if you actually look at it, the amount of the, the capacity you have to have as a person to be able to understand a lot of things when it comes to mathematics or to understand why history the way it is, it requires a level of critical thinking that is very potent and successful in a lot of what people do today. But because you're not taught, hey, these are gonna be the skills you have to use to be successful. You're taught, hey, this is the stuff you need to learn that, you know, make this letter grade. You learn it and then you dump it. You, you, you don't necessarily think back and attribute to all that learning to, you know, creating a skill set that's gonna, you know, essentially allow you to be, uh, you know, successful in this life. I will also say that, you know, it is a very evident school to prison pipeline because, like I said, there is that lack of transparency exposure, whereas there are some kids that genuinely just don't understand, you know, mathematics, language arts, or you want to consider it just STEM and and we'll say language arts and history. There is no other alternative. It's either you do this or you fail. And a lot of them, like Brian said, will go off to, you know, community college or, you know, your major university doesn't be undecided. Some won't go to college at all. And then some will, you know, find, you know, their niche in a trade. I think that when the people in power actually understand, you know, or if they decide to eventually revise everything, there really isn't going to be much change in the system as far as what we know. It's just going to be how it's taught and then breaking down that, that, you know, that blur, those blurred lines that we have when it comes to the education system. I really, I really like that point because I was thinking about some of the more advanced courses I took. Like I took AP History because that was one of my favorite subjects. Like history, science, art, that was where I was geared towards. And then to a lesser degree, English. But like with the AP History, 
one of the things that was different from regular history was the fact that you weren't just recounting dates and specific events and individuals who did things. Like on the AP exam, we were prompted to grab two events from history that we were prompted about and then draw parallels between the two and then do further analysis that, was, that wasn't required in the traditional class. So I think you're, you hit it right on the head when you said that the material that we're being taught wouldn't really change, but it would be the context and then as well as the, well, just, just really the context and the way that we do it. Because like history itself is, is um, like it's a constant. It's not, like, of course, it changes all the time. But there's a certain thing that you have to tell what what happened, and even like with that, you have to like. I think it makes most sense for us to focus on like U.S. history because we're in the U.S. Like obviously, but I do think that even with that, more transparency should be given about the exact accounts. Like don't dress it up, be very factual, not like uh like the major news networks or anything like that and then also expose them to alternate perspectives to like the history of other countries other nations because we do have like the ancient world history then we get straight to u.s or modern world history but there's other countries that we don't take into account and i understand like there isn't but so much you can pack into a curriculum but i do think that those offerings should be allowed for students who choose to do that because someone like myself would definitely take advantage of that and i I like how you kind of, you know, provided like a firsthand account. Um, one thing I'll also say is that I know a lot of things that, or a lot of things said after I graduated high school, it's like, oh, I wish we would have been taught about taxes and things like that, like stocks. Mm -hmm. And like, I actually learned that stuff, but I had to venture out. Like I had to take a business management course because for whatever reason, I'm not going to, you know, disband or anything because I, I played alto saxophone, you know, from seventh grade to 10th grade. Other less, least important extracurriculars are pushed on you rather than what you actually need to know. Like in my business management class, like we didn't learn taxes. I think uh, I forgot what class it was for within Chesapeake's public school systems that um, that they taught taxes in. But for business management, they taught us the essentials of running the business. And then they uh, also taught us the essentials of the stock market. Like I actually went to, um, I actually joined the FBLA, which is Future Business Leaders of America in, my, in 11th grade. And we actually went to like a stock market challenge at the TED and our team placed third. Didn't know anything about stocks at the time, but through that class, I learned stuff about it. And here I am, you know, almost 10 years later, man, I feel old saying that, but almost 10 years later. <laughs> and like, that's what I have a lot of genuine interest in. Like, don't get me wrong. like. The transparency and all that it was never there it was like you know being successful in the stock market they don't teach you about the capital it's more or less just you know hey here's ten thousand dollars how are you how are you going to you know spread it out instead of how are you going to make that ten thousand dollars also how are you going to apply that ten thousand dollars it's always here here's the ten thousand dollars buy the stocks you need to and then we'll see how you know how they progress over a simulation like i, I love this stuff like that and you know it took me a long time to get to a point where i'm actually able to apply it but the tools were there and the knowledge were there. It was also, you know, like I was really cool with the teacher. Like I think having these teachers that are really personable also are going to push a lot of, you know, students in the right direction to be successful. But I had I was in the right place at the right time and I was able to pick up on the skill at a young age that I'm able to kind of think on think on and think about, you know, in my mid to late twenties, you know, be able to apply it. And it kind of, you know, you get that that feel of being a kid again because it's something that you were so inquisitive or, you know, enlightened by or about, you know, when you're in in 11th grade and, you know, to be actually able to act on it and understand all the risk management aspects, all that stuff. It's like, you know, if I could have learned just a little bit more during that time, like maybe I wouldn't have the growing pains that I have now. Because everything's there for you. Everything's there for them to teach you. Like, I personal experiences are really the biggest you know learning factors when it comes to education like if some if you're able to formulate a course that is able to you know kind of arise some emotion out of your children like they're going to remember that versus you coming into the classroom uh i think the bell at in Grasso went off at 8 50 class started at nine or something like that and then 
all right, nine times nine. Like, obviously that's very elementary. It's not what you learn in algebra two or nothing, but like there's, there's just no emotion tied into it. And being since you're just like almost brain dead at nine o'clock in the morning trying to learn <laughs> algebra two, like then nothing is going, you're going to think like, well, what am I even learning this for? Instead of realizing like, hey, the complexity of this course is forcing your brain to be more expansive. And that expansiveness that you are learning through the course is going to be critical when it comes to real world situations, not necessarily the application of, you know, MX plus whatever, but more or less the, the amount of <laughs> the, uh, the amount of like frustration and hard work that went into, you know, learning that stuff. I think it could set the framework to be successful, you know, other, other life ventures. Yeah. Like, Personally, one of the things that I wish I had... It's kind of ridiculous to expect. I feel like what he just said does... The entire thing? You feel like it was ridiculous? Ridiculous to expect. I feel like he's expecting people to act like that. Be from... Get that same reaction you get from the actual schoolwork. Whether it's the algebra too. No, no, there is no expectation. Because remember what I said? I was going to... Like, I said all that stuff. Like, it sounded really nice, dandy, and all that. But then I said, there's a lack of transparency on how to apply this stuff you're learning. Like we re- we learn this stuff and we think that we are going to use the Pythagorean theorem to be successful at some point in life instead of understanding like, hey, the complexity of this work that you're doing is going to work wonders for you in the real world. Like you're solving something that is ultra complex. What do people normally do in life now when they come in contact with something that's ultra complex? They run they from quit. it. Or they run from it. That's the lesson that I'm playing. I'm not necessarily saying like, you know, there's a direct correlation. Like, no, there's no direct correlation because there's so much. But do you really need to teach in- algebra to teach them that though? You really got to teach them algebra. To it teach depends them on their occupation. Like somebody like myself, like I could have easily turned away from it if I was taking the graphic design path or as I, as arrogant as I was, and I thought that was what I was gonna do. But it really enforced the ideas. Like, I don't in my day to day job as a software developer, I'm not solving derivatives or anything like that but what desmond was saying like the critical thinking and the problem solving skills they're absolutely applicable i mean what else are you going to teach them though like let's be honest we've learned the most complex history we've learned the most complex science like we're learning the complexities of everything that is to be you want to replace algebra 2 with philosophy that's not a bad idea. I it's not we, a bad I think, idea. <laughs> I, I think it is. I think it is something we could. That's, that could be a whole different conversation on what to replace the actual education system with. Uh, but I definitely do feel okay. When 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 do we te- when do we when do we learn algebra? What uh, grade? You learn algebra eighth, seventh, seventh school? grade. Yeah, seventh yeah, grade. You learn it. But seventh then you, you learn it in ninth or tenth, depending on your. Because then I, you, you take, take it again as a prerequisite in college, then right. Mm, no, not after school. Or you take some type, or you take some type of math as a prerequisite in college. I took uh, on your scores. Yeah, it, it definitely does depend on your scores. But I took AFDA, tenth grade, algebra two, eleventh. I think it depends grade. on what you took in high school too. But yeah, geometry, um, twelfth grade, my senior year. Then I took trig and statistics. And um, okay, when do you when do you feel that you usually find out what you want to do in life? What grade do you feel? Or do you, I guess you it don't. Depends like there is no, <laughs> yeah, you never really know until like the experience. Like that's why I said you need these teachers to teach with the emotional aspect of being able to get some emotional response from you because like you can't think critically and think, okay, this is what I want to do with your life. Like it's going to be a constant flow of thinking critically. Like you need to have some range of emotion, like something that, that really just, that keeps tugging at your heart almost. Like for me, like there is no curriculum for being a mentor. There is no, there's nothing for that. But that's what a lot of people, that like, that's what a lot of people wanted to do because of the emotion that come with helping people, the satisfaction that comes with helping people. Like, I mean, I guess you could say like, if you were a tutor in in high school, like you were, you kind of had the framework to become a mentor or something like that. But, you know, I don't think there is really no, no age. Like I knew what I wanted to do around like 24. That's why, like, again, that comes to the lack of transparency with what we're learning versus how it's applicable to the real world. Because I was a really big history buff. Like, I, I loved history. Like, my, I would enjoy going to college and taking these political science courses thinking I was going to be the best lawyer in the world. But, like, 
the direct correlation isn't necessarily there. Like I loved history because I loved studying things of the past. Studying law is an active study. There isn't really much, like of course you need to know precedents, you need to know the laws for what they were, what they are, but it's an application of now. Like there, the direct correlation really doesn't exist. Like again, yeah, it's a cool, college though, right? Yeah. Okay, I feel that's different in college because you're close, in college, usually if you're in college, you're going to be something. If you're going to college, usually at the most part, right? Not necessarily. You don't think so? Nah. Okay, maybe not I always, think, but for the most yeah. part, you are. I think you have an idea. I think okay. college is more or less just an uh, exploration of ideas. Like, that's what it is. And I think a lot of people come into college not having ideas of who they are, or what they want to be, and then they're exploited. And then it's like, oh, you know, the system this, the system that. Like, at some point, as, you know, crass as it may sound, like, there is some blame on the person taking the loan out. <laughs> like I can't sit here and you know blame the system that I have this you know thirty thousand degree thirty thousand dollar degree, you know, major and minor political science and philosophy, and I'm not applying it to the field that you know I'm currently in. Like that's and part of that that's my fault because there are same people with that same degree and applying it in a way that they wanted to and what they have you know acquired it for. In that like, regard, I feel like the universities, they do succeed. Like that system does work, but if you're not properly prepped for it, then you know, you're setting yourself up. Like that's why I was such a big advocate for introducing people to these different career paths and fields prior to them uh, committing. Yeah. And it's, it's the same thing when it comes to the actual like economic system in itself. Like at some point you have to be the person to blame within the system itself because there are multiple opportunities for you to change your living you know the way the I, what's your quality of life like yes it's really hard yes getting a four-year degree in college is really hard because a lot of us are doing it on you know twenty dollars a week or whatever like it is really hard and if you live on campus okay cool you know you might have a little bit more of spend but people commuting like i had twenty dollars a week for gas and i had about thirty or forty dollars a week for food that covered breakfast lunch and dinner like it's it's complete it's really unrealistic at some point, you know, I got to take the blame. Like, this is what I am putting myself through. Is the end goal really worth it? It's the same stuff that applies. Like, this, our, the system that we're currently in, like, as adults, was the same system we were in as college students. And it was the same system that we were in as, you know, high school, middle school, and elementary school. It's like, it's, a, it's definitely a reward system for people that are willing to put in more work than, than others. It just so happens that as an adult, there really isn't a curriculum. It's you're literally just freelancing. The curriculum applies to those who want to go into the nine to five world, but then it's the freelancers for the people that want to be your entrepreneurs and you know business owners or whatever it may be. What did you say about the learning taxes in school again? They teach it, but it's like a, um, it's not a required course. Like it's the equivalent of business management. I think it's finance. I think it, I think the class is actually called finance. Like it's not so a required teach it class. as an extra, yeah, extracurricular activity. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Or I'm sorry, we're saying extracurricular, like it's a uh, after school. It's a uh, elective. Yeah, elective. Like exactly. like, yeah, elective. Yeah. That's what I mean. Yeah. Exactly. And then with with classes like that, offer it, and a lot of people think, or they'll say, "I wish we were taught this." It's like how many people actually take advantage of things like that, like and actually immerse themselves in it. Kind of like you said with your your experience with stock, like. Myself, I took Spanish for four years. I really wish that I would have taken it more seriously. Like, I passed it with a B every year, but you know, after school, I started to, to really wish that I'd take it more seriously and want to get on the Duolingo app and start to practice it you know, on and off for the past few years. But I feel like a lot of people they'll say that they wish things were taught, whether they wish they had were in there, but were you really in the, in the frame of mind or would you have really paid attention and benefited from it? Like saying that, okay, well, um, I wish that they taught us how to to do our taxes. Okay, if it was required for everyone, I mean, that would be great. I really do feel like that's something that's widely applicable enough to where you could make that argument. But I still feel like some people wouldn't take advantage of it. And then that goes back to what you were saying. There's some it's a blame. Right. It, yeah, it's a blame game thing. Like you're able to blame the school system for not teaching you this thing that was an elective. But if they teach it to you and you still are not successful at it. And who do you blame? Exactly. Maybe it's the way they teach you. Maybe it's the way they taught you, I mean. I mean, taxes are like 
Really. Everybody like, doesn't I mean, learn the same. Everybody doesn't learn the same way, though. You're right. Yeah, and when it comes to like science, history, all that other stuff, like people find ways to learn it. But taxes are black and white. Like you do this, you do that. You don't do this, you don't do that. Okay. Like it's not one of those things to where like, and don't get me wrong, like I don't want to sound like a dickhead, but like taxes is one of those things where you do this or you face like it's literally like that Asian if, system that you're if, mentioning. If if it was that easy and it presented that type of consequences, you, that type of consequence, you still feel that people wouldn't take it that serious while in high school. I don't. Yeah, or I, don't I guess I, don't. I guess I guess while in high school or whenever they you feel that they should. No, no, I, I'm not saying black and white as in the sense it's easy. I'm saying it's black and white in the sense of you do this, you do that, you don't do this, you don't do that. As far as like paying your taxes or why you shouldn't defer your taxes or things like that, like that stuff is cut and paste. Like you can literally look it up online right now and read it word for word and have a you know exact understanding of what it means. It's just that we don't do it, and then we look for people to blame because we're stuck with the the ramifications or the consequences that come with this stuff. And let's not, I mean, let's be honest, like the consequences for taxes is, you know, penalties, fines, jail. Like it's literally the same thing that you're mentioning with the Asian students. Like if you, if you're required to learn something and this is hypothetical, of course, if you're required to learn something when it comes to taxes, it is your responsibility to learn it and be successful at it. And it's just at this point because there is not that expectation of us to learn it because it's not taught then there's a little that that gray area where you can say i don't know if learning taxes was a main class would it be the same way like would people still not take it seriously if it was a main class and one of the main things taught in school like let's say let's say high school 10th or 11th grade I mean, you're still a child at that point. Like, let's be honest. Like a lot of you have child, your, You're still a child at 20. That's what I'm saying. Like you're still a child at that point, but it is still a responsibility to learn it. Like we can't, we can't fault how we are viewed. Like if we're, okay, we're, we're 21. If the average age for buying a house 50 years ago was like 22 or something. And now it's like 30 or 40, like it is what it is. Like we still have to learn it. We still have to, you know, still essentially have to play a part of the system. Like, I don't want to sound too cold, but like, people hate the system, but the system is still going to bitch you the more you complain about it. It's either you a acknowledge your acknowledge your qualms with the system or whatever you may have with it, and learn to do something that makes life a little bit easier, worth living for you, or you complain that you continue to complain about it and get violated by it. Like that's really just the cold, harsh reality of it. Do I think it's fair? Absolutely not. But am I going to sit here and continue to play the blame game? Like, okay, there's still Jeff Bezos is worth this amount of money. I'm making this amount of money. When is when is my little tax break going to come? Like, we can either continue to play the blame game, or we can continue to look for ways to to create wealth for ourselves to where it continues to to you know increase as time progresses. Same thing with education. We can either continue our own education because a lot of people think education stops at, at 17 18 or 22 when you graduate it doesn't like you have to continue to read if you want to be great at a specific field you have to continue to excel and read in that field like your professionals like your your lawyers your doctors like they have to renew their license every such amount of time like i think it's either two or five years like it's something it's not, like it's it's literally the equivalent you have to take of a test get, or do yes, they just pay money so you, no, you have to take a test to okay. get your license, and then you have to continue to take that a test to renew your license. Okay. Like my uh, god brother, he just had to sit through an eight-hour course to renew his license for Virginia mm-hmm. as a practice attorney. Like, this is stuff that they have to do, and you have to pay for the course on top of that. Like, don't get me wrong. Like, I understand there is a lot of emotions with people being left behind, but at the same time, like, people we have been like conditioned to be reactive instead of proactive like we react to things as they happen to us instead of you know taking the initiative to and i think that that's like really the main difference between you want to say our educational system versus you know europe or whatever like i think just that like as you said our freedoms and our liberties have allowed us to be reactive 
Okay. Like, don't get me wrong, there is a lot wrong with the, you know, the educational system and things how it's taught. But like, as I laid it down, like, I think a lot of what's wrong with it is just the transparency in itself. Like, why are we having doctors and lawyers and, you know, astronauts and all that come to, you know, field day when we're in second or third grade, but they're not coming 10th, 11th, 12th grade before we're getting ready to go off to college or before as we're applying for college. Like, that's the type of experience that we need because that is something that could trigger one of those emotional responses. Like, you get a taste of what, even if it's just from another person's perspective, you get a taste of that, then you can kind of, you know, all right, well, maybe I don't want to go this route. Or maybe you can say like, hey, well, maybe this is a person, there was a little bit of bias with this, if this lawyer is you of the field, like, I still want to go that route. Like, it's things like that. How, how much do you feel the problem is um, schools aren't being funded enough? Because maybe teachers don't have that time or that well, or I guess that um, mental capacity to even give that student the whole transparency. You know what I mean? I mean, I'm not going to act like I can speak firsthand on that because I actually went to one of the best schools in the state of Virginia. Grass fed with all smart yeah. boards. First smart yeah, boards like, in Chesapeake. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I <know>. I <laughs> like I, I had I had the privilege of going to a really good school, so I don't want to try and put up a front. Like I know what it's like to go to a, you know, under um, a underfunded school because I, I really don't. No okay. question. What do you think, Brian? Could you repeat the question again? Uh, how much do you feel it's um, the schools aren't being funded enough and that's causing the lack of transparency? I feel like I'm, I'm in a similar boat to Desmond. Like I went to the, one of the best schools in the area. I'm not gonna, I don't know how they ranked in the state. I would say that they were pretty good, but we definitely had like, for example, computer labs. Like there are some schools that don't have them, but I mean, even if you want to acknowledge the ones that don't have resources like that, I don't know if we can say that that's like the overwhelming majority or how large of a number that is. I don't have the statistics on that, but I can say that for the ones that do have, I feel like the average school has enough to where they can, where they can adequately teach children. It's just a matter of taking advantage of this of the, uh, the educational system that's provided to you. Like, of course, there's going to be some schools that are better. They have smart boards in every classroom, and they have the state of the art facility. They have um, they have Chick Fil A for lunch. They have the best sports teams. They have the new training facility for the sports teams. They have everything like that. Like, of course, there are schools that are different like that, but I don't think that 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 is an accurate depiction of the schools that everyone goes to either. Like, there's a wide range. Okay, I'm just interested in uh, in how Desmond felt as far as the transparency part and come on top of the lack of funding. But okay, uh, did you you didn't necessarily answer the actual question though, right, Des? As far as because you said you don't have enough that much yeah, yeah, knowledge yeah. as far as like okay, but what, don't what, get me. I was gonna say said? don't get me wrong at the same time because like even though I went to one of the best schools in Virginia, there wasn't a lot of transparency. Like, there's a reason why like I'm just now being able to you know break down what it is I learned back in 11th grade and understand why like I was in the same boat as probably you know 90 percent as, as all other you know young adults and, and teenagers like I, I didn't understand the purpose of me learning this stuff and I don't think you know our parents or the generations before before us had the enlightenment that we have or the ability to think the way that we have like there's there's the reason why people say like the millennials are one of the smartest generations to ever exist is because we're able to you know look at this stuff from a different perspective than what our parents or what our you know siblings after us may look at this stuff and i think that you know progressively i'm able to look at this stuff and say well damn we learned critical thinking in in 11th grade or back in 2011 or 12 when i was learning algebra then we kind of did learn a little bit of um you know deductive reasoning or things like that you know language arts when we're reading these paragraphs and then trying to match everything together like it is stuff that we learned but there was so much fluff in it and there wasn't enough like real world application for us to get that transparency that i'm now referring to um i'm not going to say that maybe that's what japan or any of them uh, kind of you know teach what i will say is from the one experience that i did have because my eighth grade year we partnered with one of like the uh, Japanese schools off base and we um, our band team played a uh, we were all we all learned the same pieces and we played the same, same pieces like a joint concert but I will tell you that like the Japanese first chair for alto sax was way better than our first chair alto sax 
and that's not that that might just be like you know a gift of you know the music for that individual or it could just be that like the requirements and expectations for you to be first chair was so much higher within their structure than it was in ours like that's, that's maybe like the one thing that I can say in regards to you know coming into contact with an Asian school because I mean you hear you kind of hear like you know they go to school all day like they go to school like it's a nine to five but you don't ever see it because they really do like I think they go to school at like 7 a.m and then they get out at five like it is something that they they spend a lot of and and to you know I guess to provide a little bit more knowledge like they have to take the train to school like they don't have a, a bus system like they hop on the same train that you and I would hop on to go you know to Tokyo or go to work or whatever they're on the same train going to school so you know I guess they, they get a little bit more independence and I guess that independence you know kind of sets the grassroots for a free mind or whatever but you know that's as much as I can think like I, I, like I guess you could say when you're going to school when you're taking the same transportation as as you know people you know twice three times four times their age like you're more than like you're more likely to come into contact with certain experiences that a lot of us don't come into contact until we're in our 18 19 or until we're coming to contact with these same people it was interesting you said that because when you said they uh take the trains and stuff by themselves think about kids in new york who goes and take the train by themselves and that's considered more of a fast lifestyle and they learn things quicker than you know kids rather like yeah. down south or something like that so i was thinking okay that's interesting okay you gonna say something brian yeah i just really want to say that i really like the uh what desmond was saying about the alto sax i think that could have been a direct consequence of the lack of those freedoms so he could have been i don't know if he was if he had to be in the band or whether once you were there like you were stuck you couldn't transfer out of it and so or just like would you say like the the training regimen it's like you can be theoretically be in a band inside of the American school system and just do it recreationally and get mediocre results. But I do have, well, I kind of have a an idea of why I think the, the education system may be falling behind with uh, in line with what we're saying. And much like you guys, I don't have any experience in any of these other systems, but I can speak about general things that I've observed. And I do think the difference in between, say, us and then the let's use japan as an example i know that they're probably not the best one because there's we're so dissimilar even though we are similar in a lot of ways but i do think our value system is different like they value the education a lot more than we do as we go throughout the public school system and they take it a lot more seriously and like it could be in large part to what you said like the the freedoms and the laziness is what permits us to be this way but with them not having that that contributes to their culture they definitely take it a lot more seriously than we do yeah, I think that's what I references in the other episode too about you know they they take it more seriously. It's more yeah. more of a value to them. Yeah, we take it so like we see it's more alluring for someone to want to be a social media influencer or a rapper or something like that as opposed to being a doctor or something else of of that caliber that requires intensive study and and commitment. And I think that that's that's also responsible for it. Like, is is social media present in these other countries? Sure, but. I really think it's a real prominence and we tend to value things a lot differently like our americans are much different people than other countries like if you even think about the the way like some of our grad programs are i don't know what the grad programs are like in your specific fields of study but like the graduate students in ODU's computer science uh, department they were all foreigners so you have students who study hard they come from overseas they get scholarships or some of them they save up money their parents put them through there anyhow they end up in the united states and they study their asses off i'm talking like consistently they, they put their heads down for like five years and then they may stay around they may start their own practice they may become a professor they might go back but those are the ones that are consistently putting in the work and end up at the top caliber but we have a severe lack of those when it comes to like our own people like that come that come from our own school system so it's like do you, do you feel that's gonna come back and haunt us in the future yeah because i mean we're starting to see some, some of that now to where people get their degrees and leave out and like is there anything wrong with that no i mean they're, they're totally they're totally permitted to do it but i think it was um i was listening to a, a debate earlier and this is one professor it's this famous guy uh, i want to look his name up real quick 
Have you heard of uh, Michi Okaku, the physicist? I know you've seen his face before. He's on a lot of, like the uh, the big debates, and then also like anything involving like time and physics. He's always on the TV specials. But he was saying essentially the 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 study visa program is what's pretty much propping us up. And, and when you come to like, if you were to remove that, we would lose a lot of the graduate students. A lot of people who are coming over here and contributing towards these companies and joining because like i said like the odu computer science department most of our most of the students in there were i can't say they were indian but i can say that they did come from that part of the world they were they came from asia like there weren't many there weren't there was nowhere near as many of us american-born students that were going to uh to those graduate programs does if if you agree with Brian, do you feel it's going to hunt us? Come back to hunt us? I, I agree 100% with Brian, just because um, at ADP, all of our software developers on our fifth floor are are Indian. There's maybe like two or three American, but a lot of them are Indian. Um, but do I feel like it's going to haunt us? No, because I don't think we've had a chance to see what this next generation is going to um, bring forth yet. Like a lot of kids in this next generation aren't really tech savvy they just haven't had the chance i guess to you know put forth their skills but like i think a lot of kids that are in the 12 to 16 year old range like i think they will be the tell all if if you know a lot of um i guess you say they'll be the tell off if we're going to be able to even the playing field when it comes to tech you don't feel that the advancement of technology is just going to make us even more lazier as generations uh, get, um, I'm not saying advancement, I'm more or less just saying exposure. Like they're being, they've oh, yeah, been exposed to tech their entire life. Whereas like you and I, our generation, like we didn't really get that exposure to tech until like almost out, outside of middle school. Yeah, middle like I took school. my first keyboard class and I think we were taking keyboard classes in like fourth grade, but like, I know I took my first coding class in eighth grade and I'm pretty sure like the possibility for this generation is maybe like sixth grade or maybe even fifth grade. Like I know when I was, um, you know, doing a lot of after school care right after I graduated high school, like a lot of those kids, the math that they were learning, there was, they were teaching it in a more complex way than what, how they taught us. Okay. The reason that I say it may come back to bite us. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, I'm, you good. The reason that I was saying that it may come back to bite us because what if those students who are coming and taking these graduate programs, getting their doctor's degrees, what if they decide to, hey, go back to their home countries, potentially? It's like, okay, well, we lose a significant contributor to our workforce that is leading to the advancement of our society. Why would they do that, though? I'm saying it's a possibility. That's something very uncertain. Of course, you know, people come here for a reason because it's, it's for safety. Yeah, I feel like that would take a huge thing that happens in the United States for everybody. So, you know what? Yeah, we, this is, they, they're done. We got to go. I mean, we've, we seen, we've seen a lot of stuff happen over the past, what, year? True, that's all, yeah, I know. That, that's what I'm <laughs> so, saying. Like, what, 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 would, what would have to be for that to happen? Like, That's what I'm saying. Like, so, we okay. don't we don't know how, like, the future is very uncertain. And I'm saying if something like that does happen, like, a lot of the qualified individuals that we do have, we would be at risk of losing them. So, I mean, that, I feel like that wouldn't be a good scenario even though they would cause something really serious for that to happen. Everybody just migrate home. That's funny. <laughs> so you know what we're done. <laughs> but on, on top of that, I think we're also maybe discrediting what their workforce may be like. Like maybe the what they're coming over here and they're learning computer science, the amount of money that they can make in their home country could be 10 times more than what they're making here. But it's just that the system and how it teaches it there doesn't match up to how it's taught in America. Or they could like be we, other factors. They could just be like, hey. the, they just could like the freedoms too. That, that's yeah. in the United States too. They could just, you know, there's a certain type of freedom they have in the United States. So, but yeah. Okay. Also, about like if, they, if they were to migrate back home, like if they were to get the degree and be like, all right, I'm out, then <laughs> like maybe that would play into their reasoning. Like they could go back to, you know, the yeah. country and get a guaranteed six figure job, whereas here they might have to, to bounce around or, you know, whatever it may be. Yeah, that makes sense. Do you okay. guys? Do you guys feel like a lot of the blame is put on the education system where it really relies on the parents? Because I feel like they're, I feel like that they're supplying the raw material that goes into the system. And if you give a system a bad input or a bad system at that, if you give a bad system, bad input, you're going to get a terrible result. And so like, I think back to how I was raised, not saying that I'm the, 
person of warrior or the exemplar of how you should raise a child or anything like that but i think my parents did a really good job is i was taught my abc's on how to read and and i was encouraged from a very early age even before i started school to indulge in my interests such as like art science and uh whatever else i mean typically and i say typically because sometimes my grandmother and i would get into it about me wanting to watch discovery channel when she wanted to watch like days of our lives or something silly like that but like just having that exposure early on and having my parents take the time and then her take the time with me from an early age it primed me to where i was able to hit the ground running and be prepared be more adequately prepared when it was actually time for me to be enrolled in school and i think that not everyone benefits from that because if you don't have your parents take time for you and teach you core concepts like your abcs and stuff like that but like you're already at a disadvantage and that kind of leads directly into what you're saying about like the the reading levels like there's sometimes that you know the kids just get pushed up because of no child left behind and they're not adequately prepared you have kids graduating going into high school and they can't read so i think that's ridiculous i really think that school it doesn't or education rather doesn't stop just because the bell ends that's a continuous thing it kind of like what Desmond was saying after school i think even while you're in school like once you get home what, what concepts are you reinforcing are you actually doing the homework like even someone like myself very rarely did i actually do my homework at home it was something i would do on the morning off so i wasn't taking advantage of that potentially i could have been a better student had i done that got that homework brian <laughs> <laughs> it's like i was, I was a master at it i used to finesse the spanish homework like i would just because the teacher is a spot check it so i would just scribble something down and as long as she saw something on the page that was that but like but looking back now i really wish i would have actually put in the work for that yeah I, yeah i think the um the parent is always a key factor really but at the same time can you really blame the parents if they're working x amount of hours in a day and then have to come home and then teach the child too that they feel that the school system should have already taught in that case yeah. I'm, I'm not but, ignorant enough to where I would completely disregard that anything. Like, I understand that yeah. not everybody is in the I, same I, I think, situation. I think you were lucky. I think that is the ideal, what you had as far as the parents that do their own job and then still teach their kids core concepts like ABCs and uh, different things and then critical thinking skills, too. Right. So I do think that is the right way. But how much can you really expect from parents who's basically in the system themselves, like working X amount of hours throughout the day? And then how much how much time do they have to themselves? You know I get I mean? that. I get that totally. Um, at the <laughs> at the risk of saying crass, I'll also say that no one makes anyone be a parent for the most part. I, you, could, you on some fringe examples, you could say, okay, what about rape victim? Okay, whatever. I'm not. I, I think that's outside of the norm, and we can safely segregate that from what we're talking about. But being a parent is a choice. That's a huge responsibility. I think a lot of people overlook that. Like you're responsible for raising a functional human being, giving the child the best quality of life. And so for you to do it when you're not in a position to do that, well, you're already being negligent. That is true, but a lot of people don't even know when is the right time to even have a kid. Yeah, and a lot of people, like, like you could potentially, like, you could have a stable partner, and then you could, you guys could separate. I, I, I get that. Like, stuff does happen, but I'm saying, permitted that you are having a child, I would think that you would want to give them the best quality of life and make sure that they're adequately prepared and or have the ability to be successful. Okay, so if you work in 12 hours a day, it's probably not the best to have a kid. Is that what you're saying, basically? That's not what you're doing during that 12 hours. Yeah. I was a product of parents working 12 hour shifts with my parents work 12 hour shifts with the Navy. So So it's all about their time and management skills. Okay. And then what kind of resources they have available to them? Sure. Like, I'll say to, even though I, you know, I said there's no you know, right time to have a kid. I think the time comes when you are financially and emotionally stable. And I think I'll reverse that. And I'll say when you're emotionally and financially stable, because being emotionally stable allows you to see things with a clear vision of what what it is you want to do. And a lot of times when you have children at a very young age, you're thrusted into the system, you know, really early of having to work to make ends meet. And it's, you know, damned if you do damned if you don't almost and you know so you look for if you don't have the ability to blame yourself for the situation that you're currently in you look for you know the system to save you or you look for the government to save you or whatever it may be like there is no right age to have a kid like i'm fortunate enough to where you know both my parents were stable and they were they they made a good living for themselves and they taught me how to be you know a great parent just from watching the things that they did 
but at the same time like that's my unique situation yeah okay anything else you want to add Brian there's actually one um I'm gonna ask this and you can tell me whether or not this should be another episode altogether um so what are your thoughts on free college education I, I don't I wouldn't mind it I mean you wouldn't, you wouldn't mind it no cause it ain't I wouldn't mind it under premise that the um grade school and high school and all that we'll just say grade school until the grade school system itself is reformed like until that lack of transparency is resolved until that exposure it is created like giving free education college education would do nothing if the original factor itself or the original problem is not re- addressed like to provide I, I, what I'll say I'll say like this when you go to college it is to build on a skill or to build a skill altogether not to go into college find a skill and then build it I think you should be going into college already kind of have an idea of what that skill is that you want to build off of and then build from there a lot of the time why we go into college without having a real true idea of a skill is because of everything we've already said before with lack of transparency and the lack of exposure so if we can address everything that goes on in you know kindergarten through 12th grade I'm all for free college education because it is going to produce a much more productive human being and that's not to say that like oh well you don't support free college education now I support it 100% but I think if you give free college education now knowing what we know with the system it doesn't really produce a more productive human being because the issue is still there before they even get to college who would be paying for this well, oh, that's that's a good question too. Um, but so, what are your thoughts on the the concept? Is that like your primary focus? Your primary problem with it is like who's gonna fund this? That's a huge problem. Kinda, yeah, yeah kinda, yeah. It kind of is one of my main things. Yeah, like who who will fund it? And what and I would I agree with Des too. What Des saying, like the main problem as far as like the transparency of what they're actually teaching too. I definitely agree with that part. But yeah, who is gonna fund this? Like, <laughs> you know. Like, it's like taxpayer, taxpayers' money. It's like, how's that? How's that? Yeah, I think, I think, I think in the UK, all that stuff is state funded, and essentially anything that's state funded comes from taxpayers' money. So, that so wouldn't speaking, we? Yes. So, wouldn't the people technically still be paying for college, even if you pay no, for someone else's college? Just, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's like, yeah, like yeah, social yeah, security. Yeah. It's like social security out of your check every every two weeks, right? Like that, right? Yeah. Yeah, but if you're not paying. Well, it depends on how much you make. I guess you could say something like that. Okay. So we're technically still paying for it. <laughs> I mean, it's not well, free. People, people don't see it that way. You you, you bring a hell of a point. And that's kind of like it's one technically of the not free why. if you're still paying for it through your through a, another another means of doing business or paying money. You know what I mean? If you're paying through taxes, you're still paying yeah. for it. It's not technically, not, yeah, okay. But keep on. <laughs> free, right? Yeah, it's not free. Nothing is free. Yeah, that's one of the reasons that I'm against the concept. And I think I may have a different perspective on that. I mean, that's that's certainly like a secondary one. But I also think about the devaluation of the college education. I, I don't say it in the sense of because everyone gets it and I don't want other people to have it and, and advance themselves. I'm not saying devaluing in that sense. But just think back to like your introductory college courses or back in high school when you had people who weren't taking their studies as seriously and were causing disruptions in the class. Well, if you were, if it was completely free, then that removes the barrier for interest. So you're going to have an influx of those individuals in the classes. So just think about you're trying to take something seriously and develop an occupation, something you're going to do for the rest of your life and actually absorb the material to your benefit. And then you have people in there that are causing constant disruptions and stuff like that. So I feel like that waters it down. And I feel like I do feel like college education is more expensive than it needs to be. But I don't believe in an absolute removal of the barrier for entry, because I feel like without that, that's exactly what happens. Like I've, I've spoken with people who uh, took classes at like the community college level. I mean, I, I've taken an odd one here or there and like during the summer, but it was pretty like high level ones. But I've spoken with other friends who have just went to the college or community college with their associate degrees and they were just like no one there was serious and they would come to class and be dismissive and stuff like that. And like that, that really, 
that really dampens the learning environment. I really feel like it does. And I think, I don't know if you guys have experienced that at all. Yeah, we experience it everywhere. Yeah. And so I, I think like, if we were to get rid of it, I think that's exactly what happened. I don't necessarily agree with you because getting rid of college debt does not get rid of the prerequisites to enter college. Like you still have to have SAT scores. You still have to have the required GPA to get in. Like, don't get me wrong. Like, I agree. I understand where you're coming from because I experienced it at ODU, even in my 400 you know level courses of people coming into class and you know emailing you know five or six of us the day that an assignment was due, asking for the answers. Like, I get all that, but that just comes with the territory. And to say that you might see an influx of it, I can't necessarily agree because not everyone has the 3.0 or the 3.5 or whatever to get into college. And I think if we're kind of readdressing kindergarten through 12th grade, then you're satiate, or I'm not gonna say you're satiating, you're satisfying some of those interests of those students that were formerly your disruptive individuals. Yeah. No, I'm actually glad you brought that up. I hadn't considered that. I was looking, I, I completely missed that point, but I, what I was looking at more towards was like from a behavioral aspect, not, not just the emailing, but I'm saying people come into class and being disruptive in the sense of talking while the professor's talking. Like there was plenty of, there was always plenty of that. But they didn't last know. though, right? Yeah. Nah, college professors don't play, man. I, I, didn't, <laughs> I ain't never been kicked out of a college class, but I've had a lot of college professors lock the door at eight o'clock on the dot or, or nine o'clock on the dot. I've had a lot of college professors say, hey, if you're gonna be on your phone, go out into the hallway. And I've had to go into the hallway to make a call. Like I've had, I've had that stuff happen. Like, you know, college professors are like, they, 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 they don't play. I take it seriously, like, but yeah. I mean, it still happens. I mean, I've been in, I can't tell you how many lecture halls I've been in where there was somebody behind me trying to talk and they wouldn't shut the fuck up when the professor was trying to teach an important concept or something like that. Like, I've had friends that were in the class with me <laughs> that wouldn't shut up. Keep your friends in the class. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I do okay. think that was a valid point about the prerequisites, like the SAT scores, the grades to get into the recommendations. And then like to advance to the upper levels of the class so I, I would imagine like it was still decreased the higher you got but i think in the initial like the entry level classes your your 100 level 200 level perhaps you have more of those more of those problems i'm not gonna lie to you man i would actually think that with free college education the requisites to get in would actually be a lot harder they would probably yeah yeah because like you said it's still, it costs to educate these people like the professors have to be paid the university has to be sustained, like lights, the, the facilities upkeep. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. You have anything else you guys want to add? No. All right. You got an album of the week? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I was listening to um, on my workout today. It was really short, but I was cycling through like I always do. And the one album that stuck was uh, Blueprint 3 classic cool. all right all right be sure to check it out if you guys like the discussion don't forget to hit the like button we're gonna see you guys next week peace but while you're here be sure to check out other great content from the breakdown crew including previous episodes of the podcast joshua versus movies joshua versus music and of course haven't forgotten about my plant lovers feel the love just check out this begonia <laughs>